Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Ella Stopford Sackville. I'm going to be moderating this session today on rethinking economic systems within planetary and social boundaries. I work for an organization called Kite Insights, where we help organizations make sense of, take a stand on, and build capabilities on the issues that matter. So today, I'm going to hopefully, with this amazing lineup of speakers, help you make sense of how we rethink economic systems. It's a vast topic. We're day three of change now, so we're going to assume that you have the context. We're going to assume that you have uh, understood the need for radical and innovative change. And without further ado, actually, before I introduce the first speaker, I just want to check that everyone knows that the fireside chat at the end of this session will be with Luisa Neubauer, the climate activist from Germany. I know it wasn't in all of the, the programs, so make sure you stay for the full session um, to hear Luisa and I in conversation together. So without further ado, um, let's kick it off with uh, Timothée Parik, a researcher in ecological economics from the University of Lund in Sweden, joining us from southwest France. Timothée, over to you. Woo! <laughs> Have you ever been to one of these all-you-can-eat buffets? You know the cheap, dirty stuff. It's cheap, you always regret it, you eat too much. If you don't get there first, you'll have nothing but dirty dishes. I cannot think of a better analogy to think of the last 50 years of global development. I want to invite you to think of any economy as a super organism, a super organism that sucks in energy and materials and that push out waste. Every year, the global economy extracts 106 billion tons of material. Half of that is minerals like clay and gravels and sand, and then you have biomass and you have, of course, fossil fuels and a whole bunch of metals. This is what the economy eats, and it is increasingly hungry. Back in 1965, when the novel June was first published, the economy required 25 billion tons of material to run. Forward 1984, when June was first adapted as a film, that number was up to 41, and then up to 58 when June was adapted as a TV show. And this year, 2024, June part two, and we have our super organism, the global economy, eating 106 billion tons of materials. A large economy requires a large amount of resources and produces a large amount of waste so you take that 106 billion tons of materials, almost 80% of that quickly get dissipated as solid and liquid waste, and especially as emissions. So greenhouse gas emissions have almost doubled from around 20 billion tons in the 1970s to 43 billion tons a couple of years ago. These waste goes on creating an array of problems. Greenhouse gases destabilizes the climate. Some kind of waste leads to eutrophication, which kills biodiversity, changing the land, destroy natural habitats, which also leads to biodiversity loss. That's the famous planetary boundaries. We know them. The main message, and you can see here clearly with all the red, is that the global economy is biophysically obese. We are overshooting planetary boundaries. Except we is perhaps too broad a term because we do not all bear the same responsibility in that ecological 
overshoot. Let's talk a bit about environmental inequality. And let's start by looking at the size of plates. So let's look at the left side of the graph where we see high income and upper middle income countries. And we compare this to the line, which is the global per capita average, which is basically the average plate that an average human gets at the buffet. Here we see very clearly that the plates of high income countries and upper middle income countries is a bit larger than the average, and the plates of other countries is a bit smaller than the average. When we look at cumulative emissions, we see that these inequalities, they're not only static, they've been going on for a very long time. So this is emissions inequality. We see that the change, the climate change that we experience today is mostly the result of the emissions of early industrialized nations, basically Europe and North America here. They were the one first arriving at the buffet. And they've been at the buffet for a long time. Today, of course, the mix is changing. You have countries like China and India that are arriving to the buffet. Of course, the US and Europe is still pretty much there, enjoying the food. And you have other countries, mostly low-income countries, that have, are still being prevented accessing the restaurant, basically. We need to look at the size of the plate. We also need to look at the impact of eating the plate. And this is what we can do on this graph. What we see here on the left is that high-income countries, even though they have the highest environmental footprints, they're also the one bearing the less environmental cost. Basically, they export the environmental mess linked with their very high level of resource use elsewhere, which is the opposite for the three categories of countries that we see in that graph. And now to, to add economic insult to ecological injury, it is high-income countries that are benefiting, that are appropriating the bulk of global value added. So basically, early industrialized, rich, high-income countries they get the resources cheap, they don't have to pay for the environmental mess, and they pocket all the profit. This is why some people have come to call this an imperial mode of living. Imperial because the economic growth, the activity, the development of high-income countries is dependent on an appropriation of cheap or free human and natural resources from other countries very often in the global south. And this is very clear when we look at climate change. So look at this graph, which is a perfect example of this asymmetry between responsibility, capability, and vulnerability. So the light blue, and let's start to look at the top 10% on the left of the graph, that shows you the 800 million richer people on Earth, including everyone in this room. So these people, they own 76% of world wealth. They emit 48% of total emissions, and they will suffer 3% of climate-related impact. Let's now look at the right side of the graph, where we see the bottom half of the population, 4 billion people. And here, the situation is reversed. These people, they own it's so small, I cannot even read it from here. 2% of world wealth, they emit 12% of total emissions, but these people with very low capability are very vulnerable. They will bear around 75% of climate-related impact. So we have this situation, high-income countries feast on the buffet, low-income countries clean the dishes. That's the problem. You've heard it before. So what's the solution? Here, everyone has their own solution. It's like a Netflix of sustainability. Everyone will tell you they've found the best way of just solving this asymmetry. So you have everything in there. You have people that want to green capitalism, but you have also people that want to dismantle capitalism. 
You have people that think we need to make the economy circular, change the way we design. You have degrowth people, post-growth people. You have eco-socialism. Woo! You have voluntary simplicity. Sounds cool. Eco-feminism. You have green growth. Should we green growth? Should we green businesses? You have solar punk. You have geoengineering. You have animal welfare, activism, eco-spirituality. Everyone has their line of thinking. But the problem that we're not using this toolbox as a toolbox. We have been spending years trying to figure out who's right, who's got the best silver bullet to solve this. But I'm not sure this is a problem with a solution. I'm not sure there is one paradigm to rule them all. And so. What I want to tell you today is how we can reconcile some of this paradigm. Don't check it out. This is not a real film. This is just a slide. I see you with your phone. <laughs> It's a slide made so I can tell you about a specific fight between degrowth, eco-socialism, and green growth. These have been fighting for the last 20 years. So degrowth. They think socialism is too productivist, and they think eco-modernism and green growth is fundamentally incompatible with sustainability. Eco-socialism, they criticize degrowth, and they also criticize pro-capitalist eco-modernism. And eco-modernism, they hate both eco-socialism and degrowth. Don't get these three at a wedding on the same table. It's a mess. And I think. It's a shame because these three paradigms and so many others—they are so much stronger together than against each other. So, for example, the first step when we approach a sustainability issue could be just to avoid the most sustainable resource is the one you can afford not to use. So this first approach of degrowth and postgrowth, what we could term eco-minimalism, to avoid a few heart attacks in the room for now, it's pretty powerful because it can simplify needs, and it can simplify needs as much as you can. You cannot, of course, avoid doing everything. So what you cannot avoid, then you can shift and share. So that the second step, and eco-socialism is pretty good at this. It's a matter of redirecting what we have, the infrastructure, toward socially useful production. It's a matter of better sharing the stuff that we have already produced, so that we can maximize well-being, so that we can decouple well-being from ecological footprint. Whatever you cannot avoid, whatever you cannot shift and share, then we switch to the third one. You improve whatever you left with, then you mobilize the power. Of technological progress, in order to make that thing you cannot avoid and you cannot shift and share as efficient as possible. And yes, you've seen the superheroes. I think they can be good symbols of that. Ant-Man and the Wasp. Their power is that they can make themselves smaller. Eco-minimalism, shift and share. We have Mystique, which can just change its molecular composition to shift shape. And we have Shuri. From Black Planter, that can just science the shit out of any problem. I want these three to work together and not against each other. And let's try to see how that works for a specific problem: transport, huge issues. Let's start by avoiding things, so we can simplify mobility needs. So that, as a scholar, I don't have to just go to every single conference around the globe. We can actually remove specific demand for mobility. We can also relocalize, rearrange production, so that we don't have to move stuff that much around. We won't be able to do this for everything. So, boom, mystique is coming in. Then whatever we have left, we need to share. So better just to have cars in common and just invest in public transport and make some modes of mobility more accessible. Again, we're getting to the third step. We will be left with specific technologies. Let's improve them. Smaller, lighter, recyclable vehicles, and all that stuff that we can mobilize to shrink their footprint. And you see, it's a circle. Then you can restart. You can restart avoiding shift and share and improve, and avoid shift share and improve, and again and again and again, every time reducing 
the ecological footprint of your activity. You can do the same for food, same. Avoid step, eating less animals, phasing out faraway products, avoiding high-impact foods, all of that we do, we simplify needs as much as possible. Whatever is left, then we do differently, we redirect, we cooperate, we share, we change the technology we're using. And whatever we're left using, again, we just use the full power of collective intelligence to make sure this is done in the most efficient way. This is really my main message today. I don't want to end up like this, beat up and bloody after seven hours and 19 minutes of fighting for the whole thing to be declared a draw. This is, I feel, what we've been doing for the last 20 years, fighting between eco-modernists advocating green growth, degrowthers advocating a steady-state economy and post-growth, and eco-socialists advocating whatever they are advocating. What we need to do instead is to form the Avengers of sustainability. So at this point, of course, I wanted the theme of Avengers to just play very loud, but I can't because of copyright, so I'm going to do it with my mouth. You see the thing? And of course... <laughs> Of course, you'll notice that I've mixed DC Comics and Marvel superheroes, right? And that's precisely the point. I don't care in which team you are. What we need is to unite forces. Boom. To fight together with many ideas. Uniting to face one of the greatest threats of all time. And really focusing on what unites us and not what divides us. I want you guys today to look around. Everyone here has a power and everyone has strength and weaknesses. And so now, of course, with a slide like this, I cannot just end up with a thank you and leave the stage. I need to end up with like some kind of grand Hollywood sounding sentence, something like, we must fight together. <laughs> the future of life on Earth depends on it. Except that this time, this is actually true. When he comes down. Thank you, Timothée bold ideas to feed our minds and to carry on with that theme of feeding our minds, of bringing different perspectives into the tent. Um, we're going to be joined in a moment by two other leaders who are approaching this question of rethinking our systems from, from different vantage points. Um, you may have heard some of the other leaders already here at Change Now sharing those ideas. The Earth for All initiative, Sandrine Dixon de Clev, who was here on Monday, um, the Donut Economics Lab, many, many others. So we're with a community of people who are looking to push the boundaries, and I hope you can learn more from our two speakers on that topic now. So uh, without further ado, I'd love to welcome to the stage Maria Syed, research lead at the Interactive Media Foundation, uh, economics consultant, and at a feminist advocacy coalition uh, based in Berlin, but originally from Pakistan, and Michelle Scholter, a social entrepreneur dedicated to building a more equitable future, co-founder and executive director of the Impact Institute and True Price, joining us from Amsterdam. Please give them a round of applause. Welcome. Thank you for Thank being you. here. Um, so let's start to hear a bit from you both about the perspective that you're coming from. Um, I'd love you to share briefly 
in 60 to 90 seconds, if you can, how you are each working to rethink our economic system. And maybe you want to touch upon how you're considering planetary and social boundaries in that work. Um, Maria, let's start with you. Yeah, thank you, Ella, for that question. I think um, I would say that Audrey Lord, I'm sure most of you would know, um, her words actually echo what I would like to say, is that the master's tools will never destroy the master's house. And I think with that thought in mind, I am working with and working as someone who is trying to dismantle the structures within the society, nothing coming out of the blue, but from the feminist economics lens, having that de decolonial view, mm -hmm. but also coming from the human rights principles at the core. And I think that is something which makes my work as a researcher much more exciting when it comes to the applicability and questioning what the status quo lies within the global macroeconomic structures or the frameworks that we are dealing with right now. And on the other hand, trying to bridge different fields that we all come from, being advocacy, media, and academia. I mean, three of them, different silos, and everyone being skeptical about what each one of us are doing. Thanks, Maria. We'll come back to some more of the projects you're working on in a moment. Uh, Michelle, what about you? What perspective are you coming from? Well, um, I'm a uh, social entrepreneur. Uh, many, many of my friend entrepreneurs actually um, face bankruptcy uh, because they have a business. Um, for example, Lightyear, who started a solar um, electric vehicle, and they filed for bankruptcy because the fossil fuel alternatives were much cheaper and more competitive in the market. Uh, there's many, many, and way too many examples of companies and entrepreneurs, but also products and services with an impact ambition that are more expensive because exploitation and extraction is cheaper than the sustainable alternative. And therefore, we started or over a decade ago with True Price, and True Price is the market price plus the social and environmental cost in the whole value chain of a product. Think, for example, of the cost for pollution and how would how much would it cost to um, clean water, soil, and air, or how much would it cost to pay a living wage? We started this um, over a decade ago. We're now 100 people strong, working all over the world. And we have a supermarket in Amsterdam. We have um, 40 more purchase points added to the um, movement this year. And ultimately, we provide transparency and voluntary payment of true prices. And um, remarkably so, we see that there's a lot, lots of uptake and, um, well, there's obviously um, lots of things to talk about. Thanks, Michelle. I think building on what we've heard just with, with Timothée's keynote and, and your introduction, I wanted to bring in a concept that a colleague of mine um, shared with me earlier this week, which is the, this two loops model from the, an institute called the Bacana Institute. Um, and they talk about how we need to transition away from that the dominant business as usual economy into the emergent new economy. Um, and they talk about it in, in, as hospicing the, the, the old economy, composting it, winding it down. And, and they use the term midwifing, which is interesting. Uh, midwifing, rebirthing, re, re, you know, investing in this new economy. Um, and crucially, that both, both ho that hospicing and midwifing is needed. So I think um, as a context for how we we talk now, I'd love to use that as, as one of the ideas. Um, if we start with the hospicing of the old economy, um, I'd love you both to share where would you start? What would be the three first parts of the existing economy that you would want to wind down? Um, and Michelle, maybe we can start with you. Well, first of all, you need to do it yourself, building a bottom-up movement. We shouldn't rely on policy, on politics. We should just be entrepreneurs and consumers sufficiently um, responsible to uh, account for your own pollution. And I don't think it's fair to, um, if you have the uh, ability to pay for your uh, environment and social costs, that you say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, just a small actor. If you have the ability, you pay for your bills to nature or your bills to uh, those who are suffering in, in value chains. And so I think it really is important to also fix on your own role and your own um, ability. Um, and obviously also there's a very big um, yeah, systemic problem here and that is um, multifaceted, but one key institution is the accounting system. Currently, 
um, the accounting system does not incorporate, for example, environmental costs. Um, we have some regulatory shifts in Europe, but it's not really more than transparency. It's not really transformation. If you, for, and that's just one illustration, if you would pay um, $100 per ton of carbon, um, then the largest polluter and largest oil company and most profitable oil company in the world, Saudi Aramco, would, instead of making 151 billion US dollars in profit, would make a approximately 30 billion US dollars of loss. That's how important it is what you account for and what you do not account for and what you pay for and what not. If that incentive would be there from an accounting man mandatory uh, perspective, then um, there would be a huge shift towards a more um, kind of um, or a less fossil economy. That's just to illustrate how important the accounting system is, but this requires much more than just the accounting system, obviously. So you have three things, individual action, accounting system. Is there one more that you want to add into the mix? Oh, yeah, fiscal system, obviously. Um, there's lots of possibilities. I recently saw in France the um, uh, proposal in, um, from the uh, coalition to uh, pay a max of 10 euros for ultra-fast fashion um, additional um, to basically, well, compensate for the environmental pollution. We see um, in many European countries that the fashion um, market is flooded by exploitative and pollutive fashion from Chinese web shops. That's extremely, yeah, insane. And therefore, it's good that you have these kind of, well, um, temporary fixes through fiscal uh, incentives to en enhance these prices and to stock up some money to um, clean the environment. But these are temporal solutions. Ultimately, we really need to um, attack this from, well, the, the core of it, and that is, well, for example, the accounting mm -hmm. system and education and ensuring that we all have a mindset that uh, we shouldn't just pollute or extract or exploit without paying for those uh, externalities. Thanks. Maria, what about you? What are the three parts of the existing system you would start with winding down? Yeah, I think, okay, so might take big names or like big um, dropouts of the terms. Um, colonization, something which is so crucial when it comes to the macroeconomic policies, the whole economics and the structures that have been built around the multilateral organizations being Interna um, International Monetary Fund and World Bank and the schemes that they are coming with when it comes to the austerity measures that have regressive taxation imposition in our Global South countries or the developing islands, which is just extracting more money at the expense of the ecological and social well-being. So number one is really trying to go into the depth of economics as it in itself, like decolonizing it and coming up with the root cause of what's there at the bottom of this whole vicious debt trap that is there to make our countries much more uh, dependent on it. Second of all, <laughs> second of all is again, patriarchy, but this is not something which is like just a term there. It's to recognize the care work that most of the population, 49% of the women, is doing most of the time. And our research has been conducted in all the countries, be it Global North, be it Global South, the global migration chains that includes most of the Latin American women coming to the Global North countries and doing that paid work so that the active labor force participation within the developed countries could actually boost. And this is something that's like creating much more of the divide between the Global North and Global South that we actually, of course, don't want. But this is something that comes with redistribution and reallocation of what needs to be done within the labor market and having those labor rights. So second of all will be that. And third would be more of like a collaborative approach, which means that all of the fields, be it from the legal principles aspects, be it from the economics part, be it from the media, and advocacy needs to come together. And this is why I see this space to be one of those spaces where we could find people and make those coalitions so that we have the civic action mm -hmm. and something that could move, that could lobby. If we could have OPEC as a lobby group, we could also have something stronger than that to keep pushing these policies. Thank you. <laughs> so we have a 25-minute fireside chat in total. We are 10 minutes in, and we've dismantled 
well, we've wi started to wind down the, exist the, the, the current system. Now we're going to move into, and I recognize we're jumping quickly into building that new system. Um, and so I'd, I'd love to hear you help us bring that new system to life. What are some of the characteristics of an economic system that take into account planetary and social boundaries? What does that system value? And, and, and what will that system, who and what will that system benefit? Um, Michelle, I'll, I'll start with you again. Yeah, so ultimately, every price you see around you will then have a true price. Um, you know, I don't think it's a sufficient uh, condition. I wouldn't dare to enter the ring with Timothy on um, being the answer, the silver bullet, but it's ne definitely the necessary condition. Without true prices, there is no sustainability. Now, obviously, you need to be um, clear on what you mean with true. And here, what we, did, what we did was we took the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was the well, response to the atrocities of the Second World War, where the world gathered, uh, led by Elena Roosevelt, and stipulated what is the preconditions for a life in dignity. And from that, in the decades that um, um, followed, there um, were ILO conventions, amongst others the Convention Against uh, Enslavement, the Conventions Against Exploitative Labor, but also on the um, communities, uh, the, the conferences of parties, on climate, on biodiversity. And these are the most daring and also, I would say, the least controversial norms, universal norms that we have in the world um, with regards to what we consider a life in dignity. And the nice thing is that many countries that um, kind of set the, bound, set the bandwidth for markets have ratified those norms. And therefore, you can argue that, and that is um, also in the, 19, uh, in the 2011 um, kind of um, ratified convention for um, human rights um, done in the rookie principles. Uh, so the UNGP, the United Nations Guiding Principles for um, Business and Human Rights, basically adopted the idea that there is this duty to, uh, to um, respect for companies, even if states don't, respect, uh, don't protect human rights. Now, what true pricing does is basically we extend that logic and say, what's then the duty to pay? And now we don't say that there's this uh, duty to pay for every individual per se or every company per se, but there is a open bill to be paid by value chains. And then basically what we say is those who are able to pay, they should pay it. And then ultimately value chain players need to uh, puzzle out who does uh, what and, and how. So that is what we have uh, designed with true pricing. And I, I hope what we can bring to the, uh, to the table is a very granular implication if you uh, protect and respect human rights, and what is then the implication for market players in transactions as a consumer, as an entrepreneur, to address the infringement, the tragic infringements of human rights? Maria, we've heard from Michelle around true pricing, how that brings a greater focus on what dignity in life is like, paying that through the value chain. What are some other characteristics of, of, of a and the new system we're trying to get to, um, what does that look like for, for individuals and communities? How much time do I have? <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes. OK. Um, so I think I will try to keep it short. Uh, two approaches that I would really like to see as part of the policy mechanism, and I'm saying policy mechanism, which means that it's something that we are working as communities, as individuals, with really strong movements around the globe to make it part, to be there at the table with those people at the power who are making these decisions. And the first of all is about the fair and equitable um, fiscal arrangements between, again, the, uh, with the multilateral organizations imposing on the Global South countries of the developing islands. And I see debt to be as such a strong mechanism and tool which is being used. Again, it's something that should be used for the social and the ecological well-being of the social and planetary boundaries. But it's being used as a tool to retain the power and hegemony within the nations and within the countries and, uh, and across the globe. So I think the first system, the first thing that needs to be changed is again the way that the taxation is working and that trickles down to most of the impact on, on women and children and the marginalized communities. The prime examples being Pakistan, 
uh, highly indebted, um, has to spend much four times more on paying the uh, debt repayments than it has to on social expenditure, being on education and health. Um, and then you have Fiji as another example, highly climate vulnerable uh, country and again being in high distress. So I think these are like one of the important mechanisms on the global level and on the other hand the legal principles um, that could be changed and I think uh, currently I'm working on a climate justice campaign, the not just Celsius one which is linked to the International Court of Justice advisory opinion led by the youth movement of uh, PICFCC and the World Youth for Climate Justice. And, and PICC is? Uh, is? Sorry, the Pacific Island Students okay. Fighting Climate Change. And they had taken this climate justice case to the court, uh, 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 holding accountable the big polluters and the corporations, as well as asking for intergeneration equity. And this is supposed to be historic in terms of the advisory opinion that is likely to come out later in the year, but a lot of states have already submitted. And I think this is something where we see collaboration, where we see youth movements, where we see civic action really going into the policy-making paradigm. So I think we have examples, and we just have to follow them in order to make them work. But be persistent about it. How, how do you continue to be persistent in, in your work? How do you um, continue to have the resilience to be persistent? A more personal question, but I, I can see the passion in your, I think in your answers. I mean, if Elon Musk can still be persistent on going to SpaceX, like Mars, um, putting another planet on fire and not thinking about planet Earth, then I think all of us, when we see planet Earth being on fire and us being one of the victims of it, I think the motivation can come, it can kick in from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Michelle, you, you've talked about um, the true price approach and, and, and the tool that you see pricing as to help uh, affect knock-on effect changes through, through the system. Um, what are some other examples uh, that you see of, of progress towards achieving that system today? Are there any examples or other tools that, that, that you think need uh, to help create that domino effect? Sure, I mean, the CSRD is a promising development, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, as um, it's called in the, uh, at the EU level. It's a very promising um, concept where, for the first time in history of financial markets, the social, environmental, and governance issues are now mandatory, a um, part of the financial reports of approximately 45,000 companies in Europe in the coming five years or so. That's extremely exciting. And also that there is this mandatory um, reporting requirement for companies outside of the EU, which have more than 150 euros of revenue from 2028 uh, onwards. That's very promising because then there will be transparency. So the information is on the table with regards to scope one, two, three emissions on, car, on, on climate and other um, things. However, there's one catch. Nothing of the actual uh, disclosures is mandatory. Uh, so it's all dependent on what is considered material. It's all um, dependent on what stakeholders are experiencing as material, what the investors are experiencing as material. And therefore, it's important that we keep a dialogue with these corporations and ensure that actually the voices of the people who in, are infringed upon their rights, whether it's future generations through cl carbon ch uh, climate change or you know, deprived communities suffering from the uh, negative impacts, or whether it's worker-related rights, uh, inadequate wages, for example. We need to make sure that there's a voice of those who are um, kind of in a, well, call it a vulnerable position, that they are somehow ensuring that it is considered material. Because if it's not considered material, those companies won't actually report on it. And you may think, well, will companies get away with it? Obviously, companies get away with it. In fact, um, there's a large bank in, um, in Spain. They have 140 employees, and they considered um, their own workforce impact not material, which was obviously very strange if you have so many workers. So it's really important that we max out on the opportunity of this and ensure that this actually will be used to also um, well, drive the, the change that is needed through the accounting system. 
that bank is 140, 140,000? 140,000, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I guess a follow-up question on um, how, how do you make sure that the, the voice and perspective of the communities that are most impacted is heard within a company? Do you have any recommendations for how an organization might, might start doing that if they have never done it for the first time? Well, I, I believe in impact literacy. I think we are financially, well, we consider our very, our, ourselves very good at finance, but it's actually very poor. We don't really know the protocols and the arbitrariness of some of the um, parts of those protocols of what we consider valuable and what not, how we value land, how we value um, intangible assets. It's, it's really important to make sure that we have literacy of finance, but also beyond that, impact literacy. And that is, you know, are we actually able to understand that, you know, companies' operations affect local communities? The economic um, or cohesion of a, you know, small uh, shopping area um, is, and the housing prices, it's all the interrelated. And we need to make sure that we have a much stronger understanding and that we you know, teach each other the uh, language of impact that all starts at high schools uh, or primary schools and education. Uh, this whole package of the CSRD is thrown at companies, but there's no real capacity building at uh, ministries of education in Europe, or there's no civil society, a uh, strong civil society package linked to this so that we uh, or, or labor unions or uh, other um, entities so that they also know what their rights are, what the framework is th that they can use to keep companies accountable. So really, I think it's important that we, well, I mean, all of you, um, we, we, we teach ourselves the details of this uh, regulation package, the ESRS, the European Sustainability Reporting Standard. Just Google it, get into the details, and then make sure that you keep your, you buy your stuff from companies keep them accountable for being extremely transparent and also living up to, well, respecting and um, living up to human rights. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks. Time is flying. Um, I wanted to ask you, Maria, a question around the different intervention points you see within this enormous system. You've, you've already talked about um, the, the, the fiscal um, and, and, the, and, and the legal elements of that. Is there anything else you'd want to add? Um, where else do you see as key levers for change in this uh, vast system? Yeah, so I think what could be doable within the structures or dismantling the structures that we have, um, the first important uh, point of inception could be, like uh, Michelle said, the human rights principles element. Um, the Paris Agreement couldn't have been established or couldn't have taken that, you know, like big leap of faith um, if the common but differentiated responsibilities were not added on the table, which means that the historical emissions by the developed countries should be accountable in order to serve what uh, damage it has done uh, beyond the borders and reaching out to the global south countries. And then you have the universal declaration of human rights principles, which is a key element in all structures that we see, be it, be it in economics, be it in um, um, you know, like the uh, financial sector, or be it in the climate sector, it's all part of it. Mm -hmm. So I think the execution needs to be there, and the policies have to be gender sensitive, and they have to be care sensitive, because the gendered lens is not only identifying the, the binary gendered roles, it's much more than that. It's highlighting the intersectionality that exists within the race, income, class, ethnicity, and this is likely to impact most of the immigrant communities within, uh, within like the regions, and we could see how climate disasters or climate catastrophes are leading to uh, displacements, um, extractivism, displace, uh, forceful evictions of the indigenous communities, and they have to go to other places. So, I mean, these policies are kind of like intertwined. So, we, we need to stop the eco-genocide, most importantly, that is taking place. So I think what's important is to realize that these problems, they are complicated and complex until and unless they're not there on the table. Once they're there, they're intertwined. So f as a researcher, I believe that it's not only just trying to figure out in the narrow tunnel of seeing that, oh, this is a problem that we need to approach from one 
um, one, from one lens. It's everything coming together, and now with the climate crisis, it's becoming much more evident, and this is why we need more intersectionality lens to it. Um, and I couldn't like much more emphasize on that. And this is why most of the policy framework that I'm also doing is coming from that lens mm -hmm. and trying to disrupt the structures that we have. And I think um, advocacy and activism goes um, with it because mm -hmm. without it, you're not reaching uh, top down, you're not leading the top down approach. So that's important part of it. So speaking about advocacy and activism and, and influence, and um, to close our, our panel discussion now, I wanted to ask you both um, for one final comment. If you could influence one person or group with your, with your ideas, who would they be? And what would be the one first step you would want them to take? Um, Maria first. Just kidding. I think, Michelle, you should go. <laughs> Whoa, um, no, I would go for the accounting, um, IFRS, the International um, f uh, Financial Sustainability, um, no, sorry, the Standards Board, International Financial Standards Board in um, Brussels. I would ask them, obviously, to um, ha incorporate uh, all the uh, social and environmental costs um, in a smart way, whether it's accounting for them in uh, the P&L or on the balance sheet, activating uh, lots of the... Um, costs so that companies have a financial incentive, that investors have a financial incentive to push a uh, more sustainable economy. If we don't take that um, whole, call it, framework into account for this transition, you know, we will have decades of uh, disappointment um, more than we have uh, so far. So that would be my, um, my, my yeah, kind of a One request. One clear ask. Yeah. Maria, very um, quickly. So I think I would rather approach the people with the uh, wealth inequality colonization mindset and would rather, and I think the first name that comes to my mind is again, I have nothing against Elon Musk, but these people need to be held accountable and the corporations need to be held accountable for that. And I think it's all about redistribution and reallocation of the resources to be, be we have the finances we just need to reallocate and redistribute them in the right spaces, and that means like giving it out to the climate front, uh, climate frontline communities, giving it out to the marginalized communities, and that is going to make a difference. Thank you so much, Maria, Michelle. Um, if you want to hear more about their work, recommendations of who to go to, so, uh, podcasts, books, newsletters to read more about some of the ideas they've shared today, please go and find them after the session. We have to wrap up, unfortunately, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last up, we are delighted to welcome back to the Change Now stage um, Luisa Neubauer, the founder of the Fridays for Future movement in Germany back in 2018. She, since then, has been working as an activist to hold leaders and governments to account including taking the German government um, to court in a historic climate litigation case a few years back, co-authoring a number of books, including one with her own grandmother, um, and really using storytelling and scientific communication to both energize and, and mobilize the climate movement. So uh, please give her a warm welcome. Luisa. Hello. Hi. How oh, are you? No. <laughs> it's bigger. There's more people here when you get up and look back, right? <laughs> it's nice. Hi. Um, Luisa, you've been sitting in the front row listening to the keynote. Listening and, and, and cheering, the I would say. Yeah. And um, what is it, is it one key takeaway from that uh, feast for the mind that we just Ooh. heard from the three different speakers? What's, what's one point that you'll be, you'll be taking home from what you heard? Well, I... I think it was the obvious why we need everything, why we need the pop culture to uh, support what we do, why we need um, the, the interventions reminding of us of what we are fighting against, and we need the people providing the solutions, saying, okay, that's how we get from A to B, that's actually how we can do it. And I think it's easy to forget, um, in climate spaces in particular, that we are actually many, and we do different jobs, and we have different roles. And as an activist, I can only say, you know, one question I'm asked 
you know, all the time is, oh, as activists with your actions, don't you like divide the people, you know, don't you, you know, seed conflict or wherever when we, when we are bold, when we are radical, when we are out on the streets. Um, and I always try to remind people that as activists, it might actually be my job to highlight that there is a conflict about resources, about rights, about futures, about pasts. And as activists, it would be my job to highlight that. Someone else might have the job to bring peace, to provide solutions, to bring people together again. But we don't actually have to do all the same things, and we shouldn't be doing all the same things. Acknowledge and respect the roles of others in the movement. Yeah, um, and I think knowing that we can count on each other, that I'm doing something, and it might not make sense, but it makes sense the moment that I know someone else is doing something else on the other side of the world, a person I've never met, but they're there, and they're counting on me. So I would call it an ecosystem of hope that yeah. we're operating in. I mean, you've obviously had the, the fire and the, the energy and the um, inspiration to move, move into action quickly and, and into activism, really. I think a lot of people, particularly when we're thought, thinking about these, these vast systems, um, feel like, uh, as an individual, they are themselves a victim of that system that they cannot change. Um, and there's a lot of change that we know needs to happen. And I'd, I'd love to hear sort of your perspective on what's getting in the way of us collectively making that change. How can um, individuals who, who see systems and structures that are way bigger than, them, way bigger than themselves, how, how can they be part of, of the movement? Yeah, it's, it's interesting, right? So when people say, oh, it's just me, you know, what can I do? We need structural changes, we need system changes, and I would just raise a question, who do we expect to implement those structural changes? Who do we expect to bring the system changes? Those people who will do it, they're also individuals. There might be many, and they you know, might have power that will have to be built up. But no matter whether we talk about that personal change we do in our everyday lives, or we talk about the structural change, behind all of that, we will find individuals. The, the difference is just do we consider ourselves to be only as powerful as we as an individual you know, can see, how far we can see, how far we can look? Or do we um, imagine ourselves being part of a wider collective that can be just much more powerful than just a number of individuals? I'm interested in, in, your, in your journey. What was the moment that you felt you were part of that wider collective? What, was there a moment or was it an ev evolution? Well, I would think that there is firstly a misconception about us, you know, usually being like this individual living our individual life and then suddenly there's a climate issue and now we have to come together as a collective. Let's just for a moment appreciate how did we get into a climate crisis? How did we get into an ecological breakdown? Because of an, a huge a global collective effort. So the climate crisis is only possible because people like millions, billions of people around the world sometimes unknowingly and sometimes knowingly collaborated. Some just with the best intention because they just wanted to follow their dreams and I get this house and this car and this career. Some with the worst intentions because I wanted to rip everything apart because they're the CEO of Shell. But by the end of the day, it's, you know, it's all a, group, a big collective work. So behind the crisis we're in, there's a collective effort, and what we now have to do is to look around, acknowledge the collectiveness of the crisis we have created, and by we, of course, we look at a global north responsibility mostly. And now this is about you know, not starting from zero to 100 to collectively act, but to collectively act for the better and not for the worse. So I think that's the first one. And um, to your question, uh, <laughs> um, well, you know, so I'm a, um, so I'm from from Germany, as you hear. And um, in Germany, for a long time, we had uh, Merkel as a chancellor, and um, I'm what they call the Generation Merkel. So as a child, as a as a teenager, I don't remember ever having a different chancellor. Um, and I found it weird that a chancellor could be a man um, because, you know, it was Merkel. And she was doing like the Merkel stuff. She was doing like the climate targets and she would go to Greenland and she would wear like the, the big jacket saying, oh, we have an issue with the environment, but we have target and it's all fine. And I grew up and it was very easy to believe that we don't really have an issue because there's a climate environmental situation 
but we have climate and environmental solutions and our government will fix it. Um, so I would call it a big fairy tale of my childhood that, you know, we have issues, but we can just resolve them by working harder. Mm -hmm. And that's what they told me. And what they told people like me as well is they said, if you work hard, you can become everything. You can, in Germany, even as a girl, become a chancellor because we have a girl chancellor. You know, everything is possible now. It's a big new world. And I think I do got tricked into that too. And so I... Um, when I got older and I, you know, had questions about the climate and I said, hmm, if the issue is so big, you know, why is everyone so calm around it? Uh, I started in something that looking back, I would call like handshake activism. Mm -hmm. It's this thing where they call us ambassador for something and then you can go and meet a minister if you work really hard and you get a nice handshaking picture. And you're like super happy about that because you imagine that that made some kind of impact because you mixed up having power and having access to power, which is something completely different. And then um, I looked at the science again, and I was like, okay, this is something wrong. And then we uh, were many, luckily, in Germany, and we said, okay, we need to start something different. And then we um, went to the streets. Yeah. Thank you. I think um, understanding the journey that activists get to, 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 to when they come to these stages is really important because I think it's often misunderstood. Yeah, well, I think people often think that activists, you know, they are born activists. And if you're not a born activist, you can't become an activist. And I would think I never wanted to become an activist. And I would hope we don't, wouldn't need that many activists. Mm -hmm. And I think it's sad that we ask people, like, when did they wake up to a climate disaster? Because it implies that we have normalized looking away. So we expect everyone to look away and to close their eyes towards a planet that is dying and screaming and shouting at us. And so we're having an interesting fireside chat saying, oh, when, when, when did you wake up? So what did it take for you? And I, you know, we shouldn't be having these conversations. Yeah. But ideally, I think, you know, why it matters for us as activists to talk about why we are activists is, I think, to just mainstream the idea that we do not need three perfect people out there to solve our issues, and not five superheroes or ten, but we need millions of very, very normal people to understand that they can actually do something, and we need them to do something. And if they're not wanting to do something, they're still doing something, because you're, not, you're either part of the problem or part of the solution, and there's not much of a middle ground in a crisis where everyone is part of it, you know? And in your work, you, you know, you started really with the climate movement. I've seen you um, bridge, building new bridges, um, building new allegiances across different groups, broadening the tent, and, and also looking to bring your, bring your platform and your voice to, to social justice issues, to issues around democracy at, at the home in, in Germany. Um, how, has, how has that work evolved yourself, you know, starting to both um, initially talk about the interconnected nature of the different crises we face and then build bridges across different groups. Um, what have you learned from, from, from those new allegiances you've had to build? Yeah, I am... Um, so, um, let me quickly introduce my grandmother. She's 91 and she's been an activist for 40, 50 years on environment, on democracy, on peace, on all these things. She's an amazing woman. Um, and now, at 91, after fighting for so long, she's losing hope. And it's really tough. I have these conversations with her. We have, you know, wars again. You know, the climate is collapsing. Um, you know, we have a fascist issue in, in a place like Germany, you know, and in many other places. So she's, she's really struggling to not turn away. And the reason she's struggling most is that she has this bookshelf in her living room. And there's, a, I would say, more than 100 books of climate literature of the past 50 years. So the first books of the 60s, written about a climate collapse, the 70s, the 80s, and up until now. And they are pretty similar. So when a book now comes out on the climate, she would open it and be like, yeah, that's interesting, but I read this in the 80s. And she can't make up her mind about the fact that we've known it for so long. We have all the arguments on the table. We know even we have the, argu the, the economic case for why we shouldn't further allow a collapse to happen. We just heard it all lined up. It just makes so much sense. And she is, she's, you know, she's losing her mind over the fact that everything is out there. 
And I listened to her again and again and again, and she's like, Louisa, it's out there. Everyone knows it. There is no single reason to further go for a collapse when we have all the opportunities in the world to just create a better world. And she doesn't understand if we have all the data, the facts and the figures, why are we still complicit? And I would think one of the, um, one of the answers to that or, um, yeah, is that for a long time, I think we've made the mistake to believe that at that point that we get the facts right, we will get the future right as well. But all that we are fighting for has never been about facts. It has never been about the best data of 97% of scientists degree or 99% of scientists degree. It has never been about data. It has never been about morale either or about having the better case, the better argument, the better business plan. It has never been about that. It has always been about power and it has always been about feelings. Mm -hmm. um, when we think about how did they create the climate crisis? Did they go out and give little leaflets to people, you know, with little bullet points saying, hey, it would make so much sense to destroy a bit more because we get some profits on the market. They never did that. They never tried to convince people in favor of the climate crisis with arguments and facts and data. They put billions of dollars into advertising for cars, for yachts, for houses, for holidays. They went for emotions, they went for feelings, they went for aesthetics, they went for dreams. So even all of us here on a climate conference, we dream. <laughs> we dream, we have fossil dreams. They are part of us. I had my first huge fight with my parents when I wanted to go on a road trip when I was 17 or 18 or something because all the Hollywood movies that I had seen of successful and sexy and pretty and smiling girls were women on cars going on a road trip. So I wanted that too. That is part of me too. So even when you have all the facts outlined, your dreams might be somewhere else. So when we now talk about how do we bring change, we need the data, we need the science, we need the facts. That's beautiful. We need the business plans. We need all of that. But what we mostly need, I find now, we need to provide an alternative of a dream. We need to provide a feeling that can actually be as nice, as beautiful at, as the satisfaction that the fossil industry wants us to, like, wants to promise us. We need to be able to offer aesthetics, the real good stories, the hero stories that you kind of want to follow along. We need to be the better party, that place where you want to be even if you kind of dislike the characters. We need to be that place where people get FOMO if they're not there. It's nice to have the facts, it's nice to have the better case, but it's what all I see with my grandmother in mind, not, as, not what will change the game. Does your grandmother have FOMO to being here at this conference? She is coming to the actions in Germany. Oh, and she is, she is she's going on the streets, she's talking to her friends, um, but she too wonders what will her grandchildren or great-grandchildren, what will we dream of? Um, and I'm, you know, when we go out and we tell people, we're building, a, we're building alliances, say, in yeah. Germany, with union drivers, with bus drivers, with people who for 50 years had fossil fuel dreams. They dreamed of having this career where every, you know, next career step you would have that bigger car or that better job or that longer journey or that um, cruise on the Mediterranean. You know, these were the dreams and we are taking those dreams away. That is effectively what we're doing. You can, you know, put another label on it, but we are saying, hey, these dreams, you know, Maybe they're outdated, but we need to be able to provide new dreams. So what is it, that life, that good life that we can offer um, in a time where we need people, you know, in millions and masses to become activists, to leave behind an old version of an old world that caused so much extraction, we can't, you know, we can't even put a name on it and, you know, decide something else, choose something else. And in your work with the, 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 the transport workers that you've just been yeah. striking with in, um, in Germany, um, I'm interested how, you, how, did you build, how did you build bridges with them? Yeah. What is, the, what is the, that, that joint collective future that they are looking to build that you managed to bring them along board with? What, what did you learn from that? Because I think um, we're in, in a moment, we're in a yeah. stage now where we have to be making these radical, radical coalitions. Um, and I think there's a lot we could all learn from you um, in, in, in that regard. Um, well, I mean, it's all work in progress and we're learning. Um, but what we found in, um, 
in a um, in a place like I would say we have obviously an issue that those places who need to transform the fastest and the quickest are the most privileged places around the world where the most people actually benefit from the status quo or believe that they benefit from the status quo. So we try to figure out, okay, so how do we change that? How do we get people to understand that they're not benefiting from a destructive system one way or the other, but they could benefit from a transformation that is just and that is radical? And I think there's another misconception about what is my role as an activist. And, you know, as activists, they always expect us to have all the answers. But I would say a good activist conversation with someone who is not yet convinced starts with the good questions. Mm -hmm. And so for two years, we, we built trust. We built trust between union workers on the public transport system and activists um, um, working together towards a shared strike where all the buses you know, would stop driving for, for a day in Germany. And the bus drivers and the climate activists would go together on the streets saying, a country that is home to the car has to, in the 21st century, has to have a public transport system everywhere that serves the people so we can have the cars on the streets but, you know, allow mobility for everyone to be affordable. Um, and what we found is that people might hate climate activists. They hate the protests because it's ultimately the buses that would then get stuck in traffic jams. I kind of get that. They might hate Greta. They might hate green agendas and all of that. But they do have the feeling that something is wrong. And we figured that out together. It can't be that a bus driver in Germany is getting... Um, has to quit his job for burnout. It can't be that they're screamed at by passengers every single day because everyone is under so much pressure. There's something wrong, and we figure that out together. And that is not what we told them, but this, that was a journey we went on. And eventually we found that uh, we can get to a point that bus drivers in a place like Germany would go out and say, we do not really believe that the government has our back, but the climate movement has our back. And that is something that is really hard to break down by a government that refuses to interact in a social transformation. It's really hard to break that one down. And that is where you build power, not with the better argument, but with those alliances, with that very trust that emerges. Thank you. Final question. Um, as the, the title of this session is about rethinking economic systems, I thought we could end with a question around money. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to hand you a magic wand mm -hmm. and a briefcase of one billion euros. Ooh, hello. Okay. Where would you choose to spend that money today? So is that money taxed already? Not so taxed. So then I would say tax rich um, <laughs> on that side. Um, I think... Uh, I maybe can disclose that I was uh, informed about this question before, so I got a night to think about that one. <laughs> and I think there are a trillion ways we need to do it, and I'm so glad that my colleagues on the stage before outlined all that needs to be done. Um, to be fair, honestly, um, we are two and a half months away from the European elections, and uh, when we look around on which other continent could take you know, a lead, possibly, in a social green transformation, the list is very short. So if we would have that money now, I think uh, uh, we, would, we would have to invest it in creating, I don't know, uh, a place of uh, counter-information, uh, counter-storytelling to the fossil fuel propaganda that mm -hmm. is out there, the fascist propaganda that wants to really take down these European elections and uh, hand over a continent that is, you know, has a list of crises to those who will make every single crisis worse. And I think that is one of the most, um, mm -hmm. you know, for, for European people here, um, this is something we will have to uh, work towards and that we will have to invest in. And I think um, on that end, we will need every one we can to tell the stories about the changes we can actually achieve. Because yes, of course, nothing in the EU is perfect. Our list of crises is long. But one thing that we know for sure, one thing we can be 100% certain is that if we give the EU or we let it to be taken over by the right radicals and the fascists on the right side, every single of these crises we are already, like, already struggling with will get worse. This is like... And uh, 
we will need uh, we will need you know continents and countries and coalitions to take the lead. So I think let's go with that and put it into storytelling, into building alliances and building power ahead of these elections, winning people over to go and vote um, and uh, to.